Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, November 22nd, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Earlier this week, Didi talked about how he's seeing in his web server a number of requests that look like someone is looking for various cryptocurrency wallets. Well, I took a little bit of closer look at that and it turns out that it's not just wallets they're looking for. With Ethereum, you do have the option to have a JSON RPC engine listening for commands if you're running an Ethereum node, and this typically listens on port 8,545. To make things easier, uh, the protocol being used here is not authenticated. It's simple HTTP requests. So certainly we did have a marked increase in scans for port 8,545 over the last few months. I set up a quick honeypot and identified two different queries here that are being used to fingerprint at least these Ethereum nodes. Haven't set up an actual Ethereum node yet, but may do so shortly to see what happens kind of next after the initial scan. Now, typically you're not supposed to expose this uh, JSON RPC interface, but uh, there's also another risk here because it is just normal HTTP requests. Someone could certainly use cross-site request forging in order to hit uh, these interfaces. Now, you may have heard of same origin policy that protects somewhat against uh, this type of attack. But as far as I can tell, uh, the requests being used here are simple requests. So unless the user agent is being verified, which I highly doubt, uh, these requests can pretty easily be sent cross origin. So this would make things a lot more dangerous. For example, if you have one of those Ethereum nodes running on your desk, Desktop, you're visiting a malicious website. This malicious website could now connect to this Ethereum node and issue commands. Now, it would not be able to get the responses back, so uh, that may make an attack still a little bit more difficult. If you do have any first-hand experience with this protocol, I would really like uh, to talk to you. So. In particular, if you're willing to share some normal traffic uh, to this RPC interface. And talking about HTTP, OWASP released a new top 10 finally. Now, there was a lot of forth and back on this. Uh, finally, with a lot of uh, community input, they actually managed uh, to get a new OWASP top 10 together. Now, what they're really looking for is current relevant vulnerabilities, so in particular vulnerabilities that you may find in new applications. That's one reason why, for example, cross-site request forging doesn't show up there anymore. Cross-site request forging, certainly still a problem, but not as big as it used to be in modern applications because a lot of frameworks, like for example, if you do .NET MVC and such, made it really easy to prevent this vulnerability. Vulnerability. So just because it doesn't show up in the OVASP top 10 anymore doesn't mean it's something you should no longer scan for. I would certainly expect a lot of existing code to have, for example, cross-site request forging. They cleaned up some of it. For example, they combined the insecure direct object reference and missing function level access control just to an overall broken access control point. That actually makes a lot of sense because there's really often no clear boundary between the two. Unvalidated uh, redirects also got removed and got uh, replaced with something that I think is actually much more important and that's insufficient logging and monitoring. I was always a little bit surprised how unvalidated redirects sort of made it into the top 10. Insufficient logging, certainly a much bigger, bigger and more generic uh, problem that should be in something like the OVASP top 10. Now, the reason the OVASP top 10 is important is that uh, there are a number of compliance regimens that specifically request a focus on uh, these uh, vulnerabilities. So if uh, that's the case for you, then definitely take a look. Also look at some of the more subtle changes in the individual uh, topics. 
Now, when we are talking about the Internet of Things and uh, small uh, devices, one of the standard pieces of advice that they always give users is to update their products to the latest firmware. Well, uh, this is not really all that easy and the interesting new little study of TP-Link equipment does really show how difficult it can be to find up-to-date firmware. In this study, they looked at nine different products made by TP-Link and just scanned uh, the European websites for TP-Link to check whether or not the firmware is actually available. Well, it uh, turns out that many of them either don't provide any firmware at all or the firmware that you can download from the site is already out of date. One of the problems here appears to be a little bit unique with Europe in that TP-Link does not necessarily pro provide products for all of Europe, but for specific country markets. And with that, websites for different countries don't necessarily have all the firmwares that are available within that particular country, but uh, what I think is really much a larger problem here is it does show that TP-Link probably doesn't have a good process to push out uh, these firmware updates. And that's always a little bit scary if something critical like a firmware updates is not really handled in a well-controlled manner. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening. And due to the Thanksgiving holiday, the next podcast will come on Monday. Bye and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.